Everybody clap yo. Oh, come on, is it all right? We'll take it back this morning. Somebody put two hands. Key, I'm feeling like this this morning. Welcome to the Great Little Zion Baptist Church. We celebrate your presence here today with us. Enjoy the worship service as you sit back and listen to the singing as it gives inspiration to your soul and then the preaching of the word of God as it gives instruction to your soul. Be blessed as God has a word for you today. God's got a blessing waiting, waiting for you. God's got a blessing waiting. Waiting for you. Jesus got a blessing waiting. Waiting for you. God's got a blessing and he's waiting for you. God's got a blessing waiting. Waiting for you. God's got a blessing waiting. Waiting for you. Jesus got a blessing waiting. Zion and thank you for joining us for our Sunday service. Here are our weekly announcements. Come and join us for our virtual Thanksgiving worship service this Thursday, November the 26th at 10 a.m. on YouTube Live. We'll also be showing the service on Facebook and join us virtually in a service giving thanks to the Lord. 
Next Wednesday, also please join us for our prayer meeting at 6 p.m. and our virtual adult Bible study at 7.30 p.m. On the weekends, tune in to our Sunday school, Saturdays at 10 a.m. for our youth and young adults, and Sundays at 8.30 a.m. for our adult Sunday schools. Follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. We thank you so much for joining us in our service, and we are wishing you a thankful and blessed week in the Lord. I don't know what's waiting on me in the future. I just don't know. And I don't know what I'll be doing 10 years from now. I just don't know. But I believe I'll be singing or teaching I can hardly find my way. Yeah. Sometimes my burdens get so heavy, and I find myself having sleepless nights and lonely days. But I believe if I keep holding on, God's gonna come for me and keep me strong. Cause it's in my heart. Way down inside, in my heart, oh yeah. The Lord. This is in my heart, y'all. Yes, it is. The Lord. Way down in my heart. been lied on, mistreated by my so-called friends. If I get another chance, Thank you it's in my heart. for giving us the grace in, my heart. in our hearts. Heart. Just the other day, somebody asked me, in my heart. they say, Percy, in my heart. how can you love everybody and some of them do it's you wrong? And I told them, it's in my heart. the reason I do it, because it's in my heart. I was just a little bitty boy. It's in my heart. It's in my heart. I used to go down to the country it's to visit my, my grandma. Heart. It's in my heart. In one summer, it's in my heart. They was having what it's they used to call Bible meeting. It's in my heart. <laughs> yeah. It's in my heart. And it was that it's summer as a little boy. I decided to give God my heart. My heart. It's in my heart. So I said, Grandma, it's in my heart. I believe I want to join the it's church. In my heart. It's in my but Grandma heart. told me, it's in my 
is in my heart. It's not good enough just to join the church. She said, if you love Jesus, you ought to find a way to serve in the church. And I knew as that little boy, I said, Grandmama, I want to sing in the choir. And ever since I was a little boy, I've been singing for the Lord. The reason I do it is in my heart. The reason I do it is in my heart. The reason I do it is in my heart. The reason I do it is in my heart. Good morning, Greater Little Zion. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad within it. Get your Bibles, and if you will, Turn with me to two passages of scripture this morning. The first being Psalm 23. Psalm 23, and we're going to read verses 1, 2, and 3. Psalm 23, verses 1 through 3. And then our second passage will come from Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Philippians chapter 4. Verses 11 through 13. Let's begin with our Old Testament passage, Psalm 23, verses 1, 2, and 3. These are familiar words we've heard before, and this morning let's try to extract some valuable lessons in reference to the sermon title. Let's begin at verse 1, reading from the Eugene Peterson's Message Bible. God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. You have bedded me down in lush metals. You find me quiet pools to drink from. True to your word, you let me catch my breath and send me in the right Direction. Now, let me read that same passage for you in the New American Standard Bible, and it reads this way. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And then our second passage comes from Romans, I'm sorry, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, I'm getting ahead of myself. Philippians chapter 4, and let's read verses 11 through 13. Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Here's what it says reading from the New American Standard Version initially. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I'm in. I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every situation or circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now let me read that same passage from the Eugene Peterson's translation, and it reads this way. Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 through 13. I'm glad in God, far happier than you would ever have guessed, happy that you're again showing such strong concern for me. Not that you ever quit praying and thinking about me, you just had no chance to show it. Actually, I, do ha- I don't have a sense of needing anything personally. I've learned by now to be quite content whatever my circumstance. I'm just as happy with little as with much with much as with little. 
I found the recipe for being happy, whether full or hungry, hands full or hands empty. Whatever I have, wherever I am, I can make it through anything in the one who makes me who I am. I don't mean that your help didn't mean a lot to me. It did. It was a beautiful thing that you came alongside me in my trouble. Wow. Today we want to continue our series of sermons under the general title, Living Out Loud Life According to the Psalms. And our sermon title this morning is The Content Life. The Content Life Part 1. The Content Life Part 1. As I take an examination of Paul's spiritual formation as you go from letter to letter in examining the output of his spirituality as he shares it with us, I come upon this statement in this Philippian letter, this breath of strength and authority, this posture and demeanor of overcoming when he pauses and yet thrusts before us with these strong words, whatever circumstances I am in, I have learned how to be content. I wonder what contributors, what kind of contributions was made to Paul's growth pattern as he's able to stand on such powerful words. What was it? in his background that caused him to be able to say with such emphatic meaning, whatever circumstance I'm in, I've learned how to be content. Maybe it's because Paul had not been exposed to the kind of life in the first century to which we have been exposed in this 21st century. Let's just be honest, Paul did not deal in the level of living in lavish accommodations as many of us are accustomed to. Paul knew nothing about what it means to ride in the Mercedes Benz or a Bentley or a Rolls Royce Phantom. Paul had no idea what it meant to wear designer wear, Louis Vuitton, Kate Spade, Gucci, nothing. Just the tattered rags, perhaps, that he wore in his own right with a bit of audacity and strength. He had no exposure, in a sense, to the kind of lavish personal belongings to which many of us now have become accustomed to in the 21st century. And yet, he says, in the context of his existence, I've learned to be content in whatever circumstance I am in. I think maybe part of the contributors to Paul's position is threefold. One, it's the experience in his life. I'm thinking about the book of Acts in which it records how Paul is stones, stoned in a place called Lystra and actually left for dead, and yet he is brought back to life because his fellow brethren stand around him under those stones and begin to pray and something happens through those prayers that cause Paul to rise from a rubble of stones. Perhaps the experience of being in the Philippian jail and, and of course being there, being put in there because of his preaching of the gospel along with Silas and he's preaching the good news and he's arrested and incarcerated just because of doing a good thing. And yet, he sings with such great joy. In Acts 16, as it says, while they were in prison, they sung praises unto God. Perhaps it's because even as he is moving in his journey and as he had requested his opportunity to be before Caesar in Rome and they're on their way and they 
They're on the ship and they catch this storm. And Paul says, whatever you do, don't get off of this ship because the storm was frightening those on the ship. And Paul says, stay on board. I've already seen in a dream and God has already assured me that if you stay on board, you will get to where we are going in Rome safely. Some did, some didn't. And as the text says, some made it on broken pieces. And yet, when they get to that island, when they get to that space, Paul arrives there and his situation where he's trying to warm himself by the fire and a snake jumps out and grabs him and the Bible says he shakes it off and the people who are observing want to make him a god. And he tells him, brethren, I'm no more of a man than you are. I'm not a god, but I do know the god who provides for me the strength that I have. Maybe that's the kind of contribution, that experience is what contributes to Paul's ability to be able to say in whatever circumstance I'm in, I've learned to be content. You read the Philippian letter, you can hear very clearly that he knows what it means to be without. He's been there before, not having enough to eat, just barely making it off the scraps. In fact, in his context of writing Philippian letter, he's incarcerated under house arrest. He's privileged. Even though he's under house arrest, he's privileged. He's chained to a soldier, but he is not as embedded in the darkness and the dungeon-like style as most prisoners. And yet still, he only has the minimal of what can be attained in that condition and yet he cries out I'm more than content I'm more than content in having much and in having less not just the experiences but perhaps maybe it was the mere factor of being exposed to people who certainly taught him how to trust God when there is much and when there is less and traveling from town to town, he had to work off of a faith context. And he had to know that in order for me to get to where I've got to be for the kingdom of God, I have to trust God's provision along the way. And that exposure to the providing hand of God gave him an anchor to always stand on the truth of God's divine word. And if that's not enough, perhaps it was this final contributing factor. He is a walking, living epistle. He's a letter meant to be exposed to everyone that they may read not only the life of Paul, but the God who works in the life of Paul. Now you may ask the question, Pastor, what in the world does Paul in Philippian has to do with David in Psalm 23. Well, I'm glad you asked that question because I want to contend that Paul's words are a marvelous proclamation of contentment. But David's words in Psalm 23 is a marvelous exposition of what contentment is as well. Paul is a proclamation, but David is an exposition. David informs us that he understands what it means likewise to be content because he has been taught as well as Paul. Paul says in Philippians 4.11, I have learned. Now that word learned is an interesting word because it's only used in that one verse in all of the New Testament. It's a word that means one is going to be not only taught, but one is a disciple. One learns how to be happy. One learns how to be satisfied. One learns how to be content. And in that text, Paul makes clear that I am a student, a disciple of God, who taught me how to live the content life. And yet David says, 
in a more expositional faction, uh, fashion, exposing unto us, the Lord is my shepherd. David says that for me to help you understand how I lived in the context of contentment, three things, and then I'm done. He says, in understanding, as I conveyed in this 23rd Psalm, here is what contentment says to me. Number one, that if I'm going to be content in my life's journey, I must constantly ask God to redirect my focus. He says that you have to be willing to relinquish your own control of how you will get to your destination in reference to kingdom building and yet trust God to redirect in any direction he desires to send you. He says God redirects because the Lord is my shepherd. He's the shepherd because he has already dealt with discontentment. He's already dealt with dissatisfaction. He's already dealt with disappointment. He's already dealt with derangement. He's already dealt with those behaviors that causes one to live in a space of discontentment and yet David says, I've learned in my own experience, when you want contentment, you must make God the shepherd of your life. And he says emphatically, the Lord is my shepherd. And by him being my shepherd, it means that he knows not only what's best for me, but he will never lead me in a path that I might experience what's not best for me. But he'll always lead me in a space in which I will always be encountering those opportunities that will build my faith and that will build my trust and that will build my confidence that as he is the shepherd, his navigational skills will always lead me down the safest and most prosperous path. That doesn't mean my path will be void of confrontation. It doesn't mean that my path will be void of trouble and disappointments. It doesn't mean my path will be void of frustration, but it does mean if he's the shepherd, he not only provides by way of direction, but he protects because I'm his sheep. And when you're the sheep of God, God can lead you down what we consider to be some strange paths that lead to victory. There are some of you who can testify that you've gone through some strange situations. And yet, when you've gotten through on the other side, you look back with great satisfaction and great joy because there were lessons to be learned in that process to which otherwise never would have been learned had God not been the shepherd that led your life. He's in control. He is the one who will not only lead and not only guide and not only protect, but he's the one that provides the necessary correction in the midst of leading and guiding and protecting, correction. And the correction says that for me to live a content life, there's some spaces that I might hide from everyone else, but not from God, that God would require for me to deal with face to face with God so that he can cleanse me and help me stay on that path that leads to much production. So we got to be willing to allow God to redirect our life if we want to experience the content life. Well, David says, the Lord is my shepherd. Paul did the same thing. 
His Philippian letter says what it says because he knows what it means to have God direct his life and enable him to be able to handle in the face of angry mobs that wanted to bring a finality to his existence and yet God provided a way out of no way. That's the joy of having the Lord as the shepherd who directs your life. He opens doors and he allows you to see where that door will lead to once you walk through it. But he also shuts doors because behind some doors that people open for you are pitfalls and landmines. And God in his quite personal directing fashion of speaking to our consciousness and our heart and spirit reminds us don't go through that door that's the joy of having the Lord as your shepherd he redirects where you may need to go the second thing in order for us to have a content life is that God helped me to experience satisfaction and solace. Listen to what the text says. Verse 1, clause A of Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, but clause B says, I have no need for anything. I shall not want. I don't need a thing. Not that David is suggesting that he doesn't need anything in life. He certainly does. He's a human being. He needs the ordinary provision that we know. But listen to what David says. I don't have to worry about how that's going to be supplied, how that's going to work itself out, because I trust that if God is my shepherd, then God has the responsibility of working all things together for the good and I'm satisfied in the direction that God provides as well as the satisfaction that God provides and sometimes that satisfaction comes in mysterious ways God provides in strange ways to help us recognize what it means to be satisfied and what it means to rest in the solace the peace of God the story is told of one preacher who lost his daughter to a fatal car accident and it took him quite a while to get over the pain of losing his only daughter. And yet one day as he was thumbing through her Bible, he came upon this passage in Romans chapter 5 verse 3 through 5 and notice that she had placed a smiley face beside the passage and for the life of him he couldn't figure out what in the world why would she place a smiley face at this passage and here's what it says Paul says in Romans chapter 5 verse 3 we also exhort in our tribulations knowing that tribulation brings perseverance and perseverance proven character and proven character hope and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And right there, the light bulb went off. It blew his mind because he then recognized when he talked about finding satisfaction and finding peace and solace, he realized even though I have lost the most precious gift in humanity to my life that God has given, he could never provide the level of peace and the level of love that his daughter now has by being in eternity. He was able to not only release himself from the burden of always wondering if he could have done more, but he rests now in knowing that he has complete satisfaction in trusting that God has brought his daughter a peace that he could never provide. 
and she could never have a more satisfying experience in eternity. Never experienced that on this earth. And to that he says, I understood now why she looked at Romans 5, 3 through 5 and put a smiley face. Because in each step, it's a progression. It's a progression of spiritual maturity and that maturity teaches contentment. Remember what I said, Paul said in Philippians 4, 11, I have learned. And we talk about wanting to gain contentment. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a learning process. And listen to what Paul says again in Romans chapter 5, verse 3. We rejoice. We exalt. Better translated, we are exalted in our tribulations. Now that doesn't sound like anybody that has common sense. But Paul says when you're working off of the contentment of God, it never lines up with rationality. But instead, it works off of a trust factor in a God who does the impossible, who enables us in the midst of a dark space called tribulation to be lifted. So that when I fall, I can still always get back up because greater is he that's on the inside of me than he that is in the world. I got some help, a shepherd who not only will redirect my life and lead me out, but who also will bring me satisfaction. In my tribulation, he brings me satisfaction. Listen to what it says. Not only satisfaction, but he brings me perseverance so I can't learn how to run the race how to push through those dark moments in which the cloud of disappointment reigns over my head. How do I survive that kind of rain, that kind of storm? And Paul says, it's the God of your salvation who creates a covering so that when tribulation comes, it brings perseverance. It brings my, my inner strength to push forward in the name of Jesus. And that perseverance proves my character. And in proving my character, it shows me both my flaws as well as those things that I may be considered as assets. And so Paul says, God can show you how you don't need anything. Now David is saying, Listen, if contentment rests on what you possess materialistically wise, then you know what will happen if anything happens to your material possessions. If that is where your contentment lies, says David, you're in for a big rude awakening. Because a storm could come and wipe out whatever home covering we have. Someone could come and wipe out whatever automobile we have. If we put it into our currency, the stock market could fall and wipe out the value of the currency. No, David says when you talk about contentment, don't rest in the things that you have. That's the reason why I said the Lord is my shepherd, says David, I shall not want not this stuff, says Paul, whatever circumstance I'm in, I've learned to be content. I know how to live with much and I know how to live with little. Either way, I've learned to be content and trust God because that's what contentment is all about. Satisfaction and solace. Then there's a final thing that David says. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, verse one. But then in verse two, he says, he makes me. He causes me to lie down in lush pastures, green 
pastures and leads me beside the still waters. I like what Eugene Peterson says. He says it this way. He says that you have bedded me down in lush metals. You find me quiet pools to drink from and you are true to your word. Verse three. He restores my soul. He guides me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Eugene Peterson, here's what he says. You let me catch my breath and you send me in the right direction. Contentment not only falls into the category of having the Lord as your shepherd who redirects your life. Contentment not only falls in the category of having satisfaction and solace in the providing hand of God, but contentment also comes in resting in the ability of God to restore and renew your inner being. This idea of renewal has reference symbolically to recognizing, as Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 3, that there is a time in which we must tear down and then the time in which we must build up. It carries the suggestion that in my soul, while I am in this journey in life, Life takes its toll. It robs me sometimes of peace. It robs me sometimes of satisfaction. It robs me sometimes of contentment. It robs me sometimes of what I consider to be a prosperous space, a prosperous moment. It robs me of opportunities. Things not only happen on the outside, but things happen to me on the inside. My body takes its own beating and it suffers from some particular ailment. It slows my progress. It causes me to wonder if there's anything other than where I am right now. And David says, one place I have found where contentment helps me is in experiencing the exposure of God, God also makes me a living epistle by renewing and restoring my soul. Because life breaks me. Life disappoints me. Things break me. So much so that I consider not only sitting on the sidelines and just watching others enjoy, but even sometimes throwing in the towel, throwing in the towel and just giving up because it don't seem like there's been a sense of fairness. David says, the Lord is my shepherd, but he's such a good shepherd. In the midst of those tribulations, he lets me take a breath. And that's important because that lets me know that when I fall down, when I stumble, when I get off course, when I get frustrated, when I get angry, when I get agonized, God steps in with a word and restores by renewing my strength. So here we are back in Isaiah 40 and verse 31. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. And that's what I need from God. That's what you may need right now, a renewing of strength in your life. In the midst of this COVID-19, you may be in a space where it's quite difficult, so it appears in your existence. You're struggling from day to day, wondering when this thing will be over with. Let me help you understand. Stop wondering. It's not going to help it go any faster. Not going to help it come to fruition anytime sooner. Instead, in that tribulation, says Paul, let it work your perseverance. How to endure when it's tough times. I always tell people, black folk know how to survive tough times because we rarely live on the top floor. 
So we don't commit suicide when the bottom finds out, falls out because we always live on the bottom floor and it's hard to commit suicide when you live on the basement. It's just not possible. So what do you do? You learn to survive. You push forward. You make a way out of no way or you take little and make much. That's what our ancestors did. What was provided to them as scraps, we made complete meals. And as a result, we knew how to persevere. Yes, we went through the same modes of existence like others. We went through the Great Depression. We went through the market fall, the banking crisis. We lost a great deal. But we also kept our sanity. We kept pushing along because in the midst of those dark moments, God restored our soul. He renewed us. And isn't it amazing how those moments bring us back to a space from which we began? So we go off, we get to experience this thing called prosperity and we were coming to church and worshiping and celebrating God while we were coming up. And then once we got up, we stopped celebrating and worshiping because there were other things that took priority. But then when we fell, we find our way back down to the ground level and to the church door. And yet, not condemnation. There is a God who stands as he did with that son that prodigal son as that father did with welcoming arms. In fact, looking, that's the glory of that story to me, is not so much of the fact that the son comes back home after being in the pig pen realizing that he had a better life at home, but it's the fact of knowing that the father is daily looking to see his son come into the city gates. And I want to contend that if you wandered off because you cannot find contentment in the other stuff. Come on back home. The father is waiting. In fact, the father is looking. He knows where you are. He sees where you are. And just waiting for you to make that journey back home. Listen to Eugene Peterson again. He lets me catch my breath. That's what happened to the prodigal son. He left his father's house. And when he got out, to the real world that he thought he could actually conquer. Instead, it conquered him. But he caught his breath when he began to notice that he was working in a situation that he was not designed to do for. And here are his words. In my father's house, his servants have food enough to spare. And here I am in this condition. I'm going back home and cry to my father, please forgive me, I've done wrong. And I just hope he takes me. Read the story, Luke 15. The son comes back home, the father is waiting with open arms. In fact, he throws a party because he who you said was lost has now come back home. What happened to him? In that pig pen, he took a breath. And I just want to say as I'm closing that God in this moment is allowing you to take a breath. No matter what it is, take a breath. Lord, I just need to take a breath. I just need a, a moment to myself. That, that, that's okay. No condemnation. But when you come back, I'm, I'm standing right here waiting on you. Listen to what he says. He says, Lord, you let me catch a breath and you send me in the right direction. See, the prodigal son could have picked someplace else, but he didn't. He was sent back home. And David says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He not only makes me lie down in green pastures, provision, and prepares for me good waters that I might gain my strength from, restores my soul, and guides me in the paths of righteousness. Why? For his name's sake. Because remember I said, God says we are 
living epistles. Read 1 Peter. 1 Peter says that we're nothing more than living epistles. That simply means we are walking storybooks about the grace of God, the mercy of God, the forgiveness of God, the love of God. And that book is updated every single day. Both David and Paul says, as little as I just shared with you, that's what it means to live a content life. Lord, thank you for the time in which we've shared in this word from Psalm 23 and from Philippians 4 and verse 11 through 13. I pray today that whomever is hearing my voice and their life may be in a space of chaos, disappointment, frustration, agony. Would you restore their soul in this moment? Would you allow them to catch their breath? Would you permit them, God, to not only be renewed, but restored that their joy would come back and that their peace would come back and that their happiness would be attained? For a part of contentment means to be happy. And Lord, both David and Paul says, I know what it means to be happy in whatever circumstance I'm in. And Lord, help us to learn from both these, our brothers, that we might walk in the happiness of your kingdom. For we ask it all in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Now, one of the great joys about being able to experience this contentment comes from a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And it is our quest this morning that you, in listening to this word, will come to realize that is the greatest decision you could ever make in your life, that I want to receive Christ as my Lord and Savior today. Listen, you need him. You need him as a part of your soul, part of your mind, part of your entire being. Let God become the shepherd of your life. I guarantee you, life will never be the same. You instead will walk in constant victory, constant spirit of overcoming, and you'll know what it means to have joy, peace, and a content posture. If that's your choice today, I pray that you would let us know. Simply call our church office, inform us, hey, I made a decision for Christ on Sunday, and I want the church to know we would love to know because we want to rejoice with you. We want to be your church family. We want to ask you to come be a part of this church family so we can celebrate your new walk in God together. Even if you are already a Christian, you've decided that you want to rededicate your life to the purpose of God, we would love to know that as well, that we might rejoice and fellowship with you, and we extend the invitation, come be a part of our church family, that we may celebrate and that we may walk this journey along with you. We send our gratitude out to each and every one of you who make this possible every single week that we might come on this virtual space and share in the word of God. Thank you for your giving, your tithes and your offerings, your giving unto us, making this possible in this ministry. We thank you for how you invest in us, and we certainly do not take this lightly. Listen, I want you to know that God loves you, and so do I, and I want to declare that from this point forward, you're going to have a happy, prosperous, glorious, content week in the Lord. Don't let anything throw you off course, but just remember, God has gotten me in the palm of his hand. Have a blessed, wonderful time in the Lord. Look forward to seeing you again. And remember, we're coming up on the Thanksgiving season, so I want to announce to you that on Thanksgiving Day, we're going to have a Thanksgiving sermon. Join us on YouTube. You're going to see a sermon that I'm going to provide for us for Thanksgiving Day. Just a short word so that we can be inspired and remember why we need to be thankful on that particular day. Looking forward to sharing the word of God with you again on Thanksgiving Day and on next Sunday as we complete part two of what it means to have a content life in Psalm 23 and Philippians 4, 11. Amen. Have a blessed, wonderful week in the Lord. Amen.